Today is the first day of the April 88 seven-day retreat. There are a few people here who have never been to a retreat and a talk here. So we will say something about listening to a talk. And also the relationship between the one who is talking and the one who is listening. We'll say some words about authority and then see where we're going from there. Not everyone was here last night. We did mention for a talk, please find a comfortable position. There are lots of cushions in the cushion room, benches, or a chair may be brought in from either the balcony or the dining room, put on carpet strips, so that in listening to a talk, one does not have to battle with discomfort and pain in the legs or back or shoulders, or as little as possible. Pain may come anyway, so it's all right to change the posture. Can one do it very quietly and carefully? That brings awareness to do it carefully. Awareness in oneself and also in others maybe. When one person's person moves with great care and attention, that may or may not communicate itself around. All of a sudden one finds one is in that same spot of caring and attending as someone who moves that way. And I'm not talking about imitation. as a very, very superficial way of responding. I'm talking about something deeper of awareness. The, the openness of it, the quietness. Not conformity of it. In giving a talk, saying things, looking into things, questioning things, none of this is done to present a teaching, to be absorbed, remembered, followed. The, the questions that are raised, the things that are look, looked at are common to us all. And we're wondering here, can we all look at the same thing at the same time? See for oneself whether what the words are pointing at or referring to can be directly perceived in oneself. Instantly and also as we move along. Often one doesn't see something instantly and then Later on, something maybe, not by while consciously remembering it, but in an unexplainable way, something is seen. And at that moment, it is realized that this is not a remembered following in conformity of what was said, but it is seen to be so. This is 
is not easy because we're so conditioned to listen and allow the brain to register this, remember it, rehearse it maybe, be able to use it, apply it. Can one see the difference between that and looking for oneself without knowing whether this is so or not. If it's not seen at this moment what is being said, or there's the feeling, no, it is not so, this is false, I don't see it that way. To leave it open, leave the whole thing open, not to come to any conclusion for or against, but to work with it and to allow that to work in oneself. There's no guarantee that what is said is actually so. I may be wrong. So if you have the feeling there's something that does not make sense, then please bring it to a meeting. This is when meetings and a retreat really comes alive, when we're looking at things together, not just accepting and regurgitating, which is how we've been taught to learn in school from very early. Accept what the teacher says, because she's such an authority figure. I just spent, uh, during the past um, period away, I spent time with our grandchildren, children and grandchildren, and our grandson uh, begged me to spend a day in his school. So I spent a whole day in Ben's classroom, several classrooms. It was very interesting. It'll probably pop up quite often, maybe, in, in talks. It was amazing to see what an authority figure the teacher represented to the children, even though they were a little bit doing their own thing at times, but there was basically what the teacher said was so, and she never uh, gave any appearance or made any mention that it may not be so. She was asking questions, while they were reading, she was asking questions about what they had read, which isn't, didn't seem to be the way that children read. It's, seemed to be some switch that had to happen to suddenly have to answer questions about it that, t that the teacher asked. And I wondered where, where these questions were coming from so quickly. Some of them were sort of interesting questions about the content of what had been read. And later on I saw she had the book in front of her, which also had the story, but was the teacher's edition with the questions in there. It was too bad, because it didn't come from her. And so that's why sometimes the children were consternated about a question. It's really cheating, isn't it? She has those questions in front. And probably the answers too. Because one time she argued a little bit with one of the boys. The teacher knows, and the child doesn't. The teacher says, yes, you're right, or no, you're wrong. And it's not questioned. Here, it's not a matter of knowledge at all. It's a matter of looking, verifying on the spot, not on the basis of my past experiences alone a memory of how I felt or saw something may come in. But if the, the openness of looking isn't here now, then it is just second-hand material. So to, to look together, not to remember any answers. Answers are not what we're looking for. We're looking at a process of investigating and discovering as we go, together or alone. <clears throat> Please.
please, if this isn't clear or doesn't sound right, doesn't make quite sense, do mention it in a meeting. Sometimes people have said to me in the past, you say all these things, but yet you're sitting there with this uh, microphone in front of you and people sort of around you. It's just like disciples listening to a master or a teacher. We haven't found a different kind of a forum to, for this to take place and we're uh, open to any suggestions for a different form. The microphone is there for making tapes because people are interested in listening to tapes, those who can't come here. And sometimes people who have heard a talk would like to work with it some more afterwards at home. This is what the microphone is here for. It's not a status symbol. In talking, I have no perception of feeling that these are it doesn't even want to come out anymore. My students, this is how it used to be called. People used to say, this is, I talk to one of your students and I correct a person every time. I have no such relationship that I consider myself as a teacher and you as my students. This is presumptuous, preposterous. We're together as human beings looking at common problems that ail this human mind and human consciousness, which, is, which manifests in each one of us. Because it's so common, it can be looked at communally and talked about, pointed at and seen, so that the pointing at and the seeing and the looking and listening and talking is one undivided process, which is not separating out different individuals, but it is a, a common thing. So in, in saying what this relationship is not, Very often people say, well, well, then what is it? We do want to put a name to everything. Why do we? Why can't we just something, let something flow and evolve, take place, without exactly labeling it? Because that would immediately fixate it, put it into a category, and stop the flow. The best word I find for this relationship is a friendly one, a genuinely friendly one. Human beings sharing their concerns and, and sharing their, their investigation of them and maybe their discovery of what is actually going on, not just what one thinks is going on has been taught to think is going on. This was so in evidence that on that school day with Ben in the first grade, how so much was assumed by the teacher and verbalized about what is going on in the children's minds. In introducing Kyle and myself, She, first she wanted Ben to introduce us, but he didn't want to, he's too shy. So she did it. She said, these are his grandparents and they've come from New York. No, they asked, she asked us where we come from. We said, from New York. And she said, see, these people come from New York, they have schools there too, they're different, so they've come here to compare. <laughs> So be on your best, because they are comparing. <laughs> she went, I 
think it, it went away with her. She, she didn't know what to say, so this came out. Also, maybe she felt put on the spot and wanted to be sure that things looked well. But the assumptions that we have, it's not just Ben's teacher, we all do. Can we become aware of them until we become aware of it as an assumption and not just take this for granted what, what sort of pours out of this computer is corresponds to what actually takes place in moment-to-moment -moment life. We assume that, but it is not so. And to become aware of this discrepancy, the difference of the world of thinking, projecting, assuming, moralizing, and the actual world in which we live or which we create in our interrelationship. Can there be light thrown on that, on that difference? And that the world of thought, we called it a theater last night, a theater in which we are on center stage, that that world of created that created world, created by thought, is not what is actually happening in terms of our feelings and ways of talking and relating to each other, behaving. They run on two separate tracks. And this big question is, can this become one track in which it is seen what is thought and it is also seen what we actually do, think, imagine, say, the way we say it. Does that make sense, this question, wondering about the discrepancy about our world of thought and the world of live, actual living and see why there can't be one world in living, one living in which thoughts that are so powerful in our life are illumined as they arise. If thoughts that arise in the mind are instantly illumined with attention, awareness, then this tremendous chain reaction of thought to feeling, to emotion, to further thoughts, further feelings, further emotions, gut feelings that we call, that chain is interrupted. Or if the spark has already flown, the thought has already triggered the emotion, the feeling, the state of mood. It happens like that, so quickly. And to be aware of that, when there's still something reverberating in the memory if one wonders about it. The thought may still reverberate in the memory that brought about the state of anxiety the state of fear or of energy, energetic <laughs> anticipation. All the third thought may be lost. One is, doesn't remember what thought triggered it, but it doesn't matter. What matters immensely is attention now to what takes place. Not taking it for granted, wondering about it, which means withholding all judgment that it is right or wrong or good or bad. There's nothing good or bad. There's only what is and that speaks for itself in its consequences. The evaluative mechanism which is such a specialized, powerful function of the brain can relax. As it relaxes, the computer up there is less specialized, less narrow. It 
can perceive more wholesome when the evaluation is quiet. But it's not a matter of saying, all right, now I'll turn the evaluation off. No one must see as it comes up or is just about to come up or has come up. And that is the, the miracle, the marvel. It is per perceivable. Maybe as a memory that still reverberates in the mind, maybe as a some something that is just about to burst forth, or that is going on. This is good, this is bad, I shouldn't, I should shape up, I should change, I should overcome, control myself. Not this again, just to listen to oneself to listen to how we talk to ourselves, command ourselves, or reprimand ourselves, constantly. Which means a, this ongoing tape of the past. Barring, bar, barring, preventing perception of the present. As it is. I mentioned authority at first, that we were going to look at this whole thing of authority. We've already touched upon it. In, in looking at what has been said, how we dwell in judgment, and how judgment prevents really the openness of looking at what we're actually thinking or doing, or what someone else may be doing, how judgment narrows and tightens, controls our perceptions or distorts them. It's not meant as an authoritative statement to agree with or to disagree with, but to, to verify in one's own moment-to-moment -moment thinking slash living. person who says this is looking herself and what is said in a talk like this comes out of that looking. So there is there's always room for error, for mistake. That's why we can discuss it together if it seems not to make sense. I may not be able to reproduce exactly the words that I said, but we can start from, from scratch. That's the best way anyway. It's not you said yesterday, or you said a year ago, or you said 10 years ago, such and such. But what are we saying now? Let's look at it freshly. I've noticed this in this political campaigning that is going on right now candidates trying to do each other some dirt by recalling past statements or pronouncements. I've never heard a candidate say, yes, this is the way I saw then and I saw that that was false or too, too narrow. Usually it's a denying it or counter-attacking. We, we value very highly a person being very consistent. That's one of our thought values. It means sticking to something and not looking. Is it right or wrong? Maybe it was applicable once, but is it applicable now? For the sake of consistency to stick with something, unexamined, is so deadly, isn't it?
parents are very dominated by the idea that they have to be consistent with their children. And there may be something to it, not whimsically saying yes now and no then, which is what we do anyways. But then comes the idea I should be consistent and, and do the same thing as I did yesterday. And it may just not be applicable. The child may be in a completely different state right now. So can the eyes and the mind and the whole body be open to perceive this present state wholly? Not in terms of memory or little pie-sliced pie shaped views. See the whole pie. And that, that takes a tremendous openness in oneself. Not identification with a view or an opinion or a belief, which immediately narrows down the mind to have to defend and uphold consistently. And therefore the truth of this moment is entirely lost. And now the, the question comes up, doesn't it? How can there be this whole view? There's no, no answer to how there can be this whole view. When we ask that, we already are asking, aren't we, for a technique or, a technique or practice to get it. And that's not whole view, that's very narrow. <clears throat> to have whole view, a perception that is not fragmented, we have to be very deeply aware of what it is that fragments the view, that makes it narrow, opinionated, fraught with desire, or, or fear. Which is always me in there, me and my fears, desires, wishes, hopes, my background, my identity. That narrows the view. What I'm identified with as knowing or aspiring to. Do you see how that narrows? How one cannot see wholly if one is identified with a point of view, with a belief, with an aspiration to become something? All of these are tensions set up which cut off this part and that part and this part and emphasize, sort of highlight, one little narrow strip of the pie. So can one begin to be aware from moment to moment of all these inner movements of wanting and fearing, defending, aspiring, to see it all as it comes up and shapes our feelings and vision. Be aware of it, not judgmentally, not with the intention of changing it. Because that's also an ancient point of view. Change for the better, change for the purer, for the this or that. This is all idea. Do you see that? What is the pure? What is the whole? Does one know that? Is that knowable? All we know is ideas about it, what we've been taught or what we've read or heard. In 
listening right now? Is the mind, the computer and the brain, is it separating out? This is this bird and this is that bird and why are they singing? Or can there be a simple perception? Keeping what is known about these sounds or what is attributed to them, keeping that in abeyance. Is that possible? If a word comes up or an explanation, see it. Not, oh, I shouldn't be having a word now. But see it. See what's going on in the mind. And that the, the word bird song, different birds, this bird, that bird, that these words are not that. That is not word, is it? Does the, the want come up to have whole listening, pure listening? Then see that. See the want coming up. Then one isn't ruled and dominated by it. Then one just sees it come up. And the want to listen is not the listening. The listening is just treat, treat, treat. That's listening. doesn't need anything, does it? It doesn't need any effort, it just needs listening. Somebody said this morning, I love nature. I love listening to the birds and taking a walk. But looking at myself, that seems so different. Is that the same listening? That's what we're asking. Can that be the same listening, the same openness? of not finding fault or wanting something of it or running away from it. But let's allow these calls to take place inside, like the bird calls, with an open mind that is clear and non-judgmental. It seems to ask, Tremendous lot, doesn't it? It asks the whole world. To listen openly, without fear away from or desire toward, without defense, without self-defense. And to see that self-defense or that fear and desire rear up. Maybe it has already taken over, but then there comes a moment of awareness again. And it reverberates in the memory, the fear, the, the desire. Can it be seen as such? Without making a thing out of it so that the openness is there, freshly. Somebody said, 
when that happens for a moment, then fear arises. What, what is that fear? What will happen to me? Has that thought already flitted through, through the screen? What will happen to me? Is this all there is for me? Will I, will I disappear? Or is this all? I can't do it. Others can. Comparing. And then the, the fear emotion. Or the discouragement. See the connections. See the associations. How, how these moods are brought about. So that there's insight and understanding about it. When there's insight and understanding, things internally and externally have a way of ordering themselves on their own. In this whole energy of understanding and seeing. Something begins to run more orderly at that time. If conclusions are drawn and, 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 and all kinds of thinking going on, will this last and so forth, then it's not insight and then there's disorder. Pros and cons and fears and so forth. The amazing thing about all of this is that this can be questioned, looked at, and discovered in oneself. It doesn't need any kind of a doctrine or belief or authority. When it is said, this can be seen in oneself or by oneself. It is not the self that sees, but this whole thought, emotion, sensation, conceptual movement that is self is seen. And the seeing itself, the insight, the understanding, has no personal qualities about it. it. Throws light on self, but itself has no self. That's the beauty of it. That's why it is non-defensive and non-aggressive. Non-enclosing, it is just opening and widening to see what is actually so in a human being and all around one. We will end here for today.